Hi there, this is an MCQ blast from Tutor to You. We're going to do test seven today, which is research methods. And this is for AQA A-level psychology. In terms of how it's going to work, you're going to see 15 questions come up. Pause the video after I've gone through each question. Uh, give yourselves a bit of time to think about what the answer might be. Keep your score as you go along. Yeah, so it's research methods today. I'm not going to go easy on you. We've got some really, really tricky questions in here today. All right, let's get started with question one. In which two of these experimental methods is there no direct manipulation of the independent variable? So pause the video, have a read through and decide your answer. OK, so the correct answer, I hope you read the question because I did ask for two, was C and D. So there's four experimental methods you have to know, lab, field, natural and quasi. Uh, in terms of this area, students often get mixed up or don't understand what a quasi experiment is. Now, in a quasi experiment, the independent variable is a fixed quantity. So let's say I wanted to explore the differences on a memory score between genders. So gender, male and female, is my IV. Now, the issue here is that as I'm using independent measures, I need to randomly allocate to the conditions of my experiment, so male or female. But I can't do that um, because it's a fixed quantity of an individual. So the term quasi actually means not real. Um, and the reason really that it's not real is because you can't have random allocation in it. I can't decide who's going to do what condition because who they are decides that for me. OK, next one, which of these describes time sampling in an observation? Have a look through the answers there and pause the video. Right, your correct answer there is B. And what I've put on the slide here is just time sampling and also event sampling, which are the two that you tend to get confused. There's also some strengths and limitations on there. So time sampling is where behaviour is recorded at prescribed time intervals. So kind of every 10 seconds looking at what's happening, whereas event sampling, you focus on a particular target behaviour. Now, observations is a really big area of your specification because you might be asked to comment on how you would carry out a particular observation as well as if it was covert, over, etc. So those kinds of questions are going to be orientated around the use of time sampling and event sampling, perhaps use of behavioural categories as well. Three, which of these does not make a correlation different from an experiment? So have a read through and pause the video. OK, now I hope you read the question closely because the question does not make a correlation different from an experiment. So it's C, operationalised variables. Both correlations and, op um, sorry, correlations and experiments share the need to operationalise variables. So for A here, uh, there is no IV. In a correlation, we look at co-variables and not the IV and DV. So that's a different. For B, can't assume cause and effect. Because there's no direct manipulation of the variables in a correlation, we can't say that X calls Y. Uh, D looks at relationships, uh, and this is because, well, they do look at relationships, um, whereas in, in experiments, like we've said, we can kind of infer a bit more about cause and effect because we have that level of control. Now, within correlations as well, there's a, an important thing you need to know, which is called a coefficient. So a coefficient is a value between minus one and plus one, and it shows the strength of a correlation. So like it says on the screen there, plus one is a perfect positive correlation minus one is a perfect negative correlation and so I guess one of the questions with correlations to think about is if well they only ever show us relationships then why do we bother using them and the answer to that is well if I can see that two variables are related from a piece of correlational research I might then want to carry out some experimental research but really why correlations is used is because they allow us to explore behavior that ethically we wouldn't be normally able to look at and the reason for this is because because there is no direct manipulation of variables, it's not something that's been set up experimentally. Question four, what is the IV in the research below? So take your time, have a read through what you've been given there, and I want you to pick out what the independent variable is, and then pause the video. Right, correct answer there is D. Now A, B and C are all answers that we might expect to see from students. The key difference between them is that D there is the operationalised independent variable. Now to operationalise an independent variable you need to include details of the different conditions. 
for an example in Loftus and Palmer's experiment if I was to use the IV verbs it's not operationalized however if I was to say verbs used um, smashed collided bumped hit contacted that would be operationalized now it's really important that if asked to pick out the IV or dependent variable from a stem that you make sure it's operationalized because if you fail to do so you're going to lose marks five which best describes this hypothesis so have a read through I want to know the best description of it from that given there all right, your correct answer there is D, non-directional correlational. Now you need to know the difference between an experimental and a correlational hypothesis. If it's a correlational hypothesis, it might have the word correlational relationship in it. Now remember in correlations, we have co-variables instead of the IV or DV. So if it's a non-directional correlational, it's going to say that there will be a relationship or there will be a correlation, but not state the direction of the correlation. Whereas if it's a directional correlational hypothesis, it's either gonna state there will be a positive correlation or there will be a negative correlation. Then of course, the null version of that is there will be no correlation. Be wary, and this question here is just really to show you that correlational hypotheses are worded differently from the experimental ones. Question six, which distribution best describes the statement below? Mr. Cassey said to Miss Stapleton, well, the mock exam was obviously too easy. Take your time to think about this one. You might even wanna draw some diagrams. So pause your video, right. The correct answer here is C. OK, now it's all about the t where the tail goes on a skew. That's really the key thing. So on a negative skew, the highest point in the peak, so the top of that peak where it gets really big, is the mode. And that's the most common score. Now, knowing that the values along the X axis increase, we can see then that most people got a high score because the mode, the number of occurrences is highest on a value that is towards the plus end. On the positive skew, again, the mode is the highest point in our peak, but on the positive skew, the mode is at the low end of the values. So this kind of skew would occur if the exam was too hard and it would show us lots and lots of people got really um, low scores on that. Now, the position of the mean is skewed too. Uh, so what happens with the mean in a positive and negative skew? In a positive skew, the mean is higher than the mode. And in the negative skew, the mean is lower than the mode. So just think of it like this. The mean will get dragged with the tail. So in a negative, it will go towards the lower values. In a positive, it will go towards the higher values. Remember in your normal distribution curve, your mean, median and mode were all at exactly the same point. This isn't the case in skewed data. All right, standard deviation. Which of these is it? A, B, C or D? Pause your video. Right, your correct answer there is B. Sorry, D. Ugh. Right, standard deviation is a measure of dispersion, just like the range. Key difference between the range and standard deviation is standard deviation is basically better. The range only uses the top and bottom values in a data set to calculate itself, whereas standard deviation uses all the values. What it basically does is calculate the average distance of each score away from the mean. Now, if the standard deviation uh, was zero in a set of data set and a set of data that I had, it means that the scores were all the same. So if I gave you a really easy spelling test, I'd probably get a very low standard deviation because everyone would probably score full marks. And that means that I have a lot of consistency in my results because they're similar. However, the more difference I start to see in the values in my data set, the higher my standard deviation is going to be. So if you are given two values to compare in the exam, the smaller the value, the less spread there is, the larger the value, the more spread there is. All right, question eight, which of these is true to psychology, A, B, C or D? So pause your video. Okay, correct answer there is D. 
A paradigm is basically a set of shared assumptions within a particular discipline, so a shared way of thinking, if you like. Now, Kuhn actually said that psychology would be what we call a pre-science. Uh, this is because there's basically too much disagreement. There's not a single paradigm, a single shared set of assumptions. And the reason for this, if you think about it, is because we have so many different approaches and all of the approaches can explain human behaviour in different ways. So there's no shared way of thinking. In subjects where there are a set shared of assumptions, sometimes we get what is which is known as a paradigm shift. Uh, this is where the current way of thinking is replaced by a brand new way. So classic example of a paradigm shift that happened was at one time people believed that the world was flat. And indeed, if you actually said that the world was round, they'd laugh at you and think you were ridiculous and crazy. However, eventually, the tide changed in terms of thought process and the idea that the world around became the new way of thinking. So a paradigm shift is when a new way of thinking replaces an old way of thinking. All right, which method for checking reliability is being described here? Same person slash group undertake research measure on different occasions. So A, B, C or D, and pause your video. OK, now your correct answer there is B, test retest. Now, reliability and validity are terms that so often get confused with one another. So reliability is a measure of consistency. For example, if I'm going to use a tape measure to measure something, I'm going to expect to get the same results every time I'm measuring the same thing. If the results aren't consistent, then the measure is not reliable. Now, in psychology, our expectations are the same. That's to say, if a researcher is using a questionnaire to measure levels of depression, we need to know that that measure of itself is consistent. Now, a really straightforward way to test for consistency or reliability is to use the test retest method. And it kind of does what it says on the tin. Basically, a same person or group of people will take a particular research method, for example, a questionnaire, and later on they will take that questionnaire again. And then all I need to do is just look to see if there is a correlation between the results that they get on both sets of that questionnaire. And if I have, and I'm looking about kind of 0.8 plus in terms of a coefficient, uh, that or higher, then I'm going to say that it has reliability. Question 10. Put these sections in order, first to fourth, for how they would appear in a psychological report. So you're going to give me four letters in a particular order for the order that they appear here. OK, pause your video. Right, your correct answer is B, D, C, A. So abstract introduction method results. Now, there is a couple missing here as well. Discussion and references. You have to know this. You actually have to know the sections in a psychological report. So think about the order of them, but also what is actually in each section. So do you know, for example, what's in the abstract? Do you know the subsections of the method, sample, procedure, apparatus, etc.? cetera? Um, results is pretty self-explanatory. Did you know that in the discussion section, it is a discussion of the findings in relation to previous research and perhaps ideas for future research, etc.? So think about in this particular area of the specification, do you know the order that they appear in the report and do you also know a bit about what each section does? Question 11. What is the most commonly accepted level of probability used in psychological research? Pause the video. Right, your correct answer there is A, and technically how it is on there is how it should be written. And that just means that P is equal to or less than 5%. Um, but what does this actually mean? Because this is sometimes where we get a bit tripped up. It basically refers to how much confidence there is in our findings. So a researcher is never going to be 100% confident about our results, and the p-value that's used reflects this. So typically within psychology, this 5% level is used, and it basically means somewhere along the lines is around the 5% likelihood that the findings are caused by chance with a 95% degree of confidence in our results. What it also means when using the 5% level is there is a 5% chance of making a type 1 error. If I'm using the 1% level, there is a 1% chance of making a type 1 error. Question 12. Which of these is not true of the sign test? So not true. 
pause your video. OK, the correct answer there is C. Now, remember with the sign test, this is the one that you have to know how to do because you could be asked to calculate it in the exam. Now, S in the sign test is the calculated value. Uh, and this is the one that you compare to the critical value. Um, and in order to get to S, it's basically just looking at we, what you've got and you take the smaller value of the, either the positive or the negatives. So in my results, if I got five positives and 12 negatives, my value for S would be five because five is smaller than 12. Now for the sign test, you need a repeated measures design, looking for a difference and to have nominal data. So that's to say data is in categories. Uh, DF is used is not true of the sign test because the sign test, of course, uses N uh, number of participants instead of DF. Question 13, which of these tests, and you can select more than one if you want, use DF instead of N? Said it wasn't gonna be easy, didn't I? Pause the video. Alrighty, your correct answer is A, C, and D. Let's we'll take a little look at this. Um, so let's have a look at chi-squared here. Now in chi-squared, something used a contingency table um, shows the data that you have. So here's a set of data for a piece of research looking to see if there's a difference between the preference of cats or dogs as a pet um, from psychology and math students. Now, chi-squared uses df instead of n. And in order to calculate df for chi-squared, you need to do number of rows take away one multiplied by number of columns take away one. Where this gets a little confusing is sometimes students want to include the total column and row when they're coming to DF. So when you're calculating DF, you leave those totals out. So you see how I've highlighted it here. I've highlighted the two rows of our actual data and the two columns of our actual data. So DF calculation is two rows minus one multiplied by two columns minus one, which is one. OK, now this contingency table for chi-squared has come up before. So please have a little bit of a look around it. Now, it says about only calculating the sign test, but chi-squared contingency perhaps is a possible question, as also maybe calculation for DF or at least recognising what DF is. 14. What's the test? So I want you to read that stem and tell me which statistical test you would use to analyse that. Right, correct answer here is D, Mann-Whitney. So why is it Mann-Whitney? Well, we're looking for a difference. So what we're looking for a difference is in those attraction ratings given by the males and females. We've got ordinal data because we've got ratings of attraction. Now we're going to infer, of course, that it's an independent measure design because you can't be both male and female. And in this sense, it's a quasi experiment. So if you look at my little table on there, I've got test a difference and I've got unrelated design. Ordinal data takes me into Man Whitney. Final question. What's the test here? So again, read through what you've been given and decide what the test is. Pause your video. OK, your correct answer there is A chi-squared. So again, we are doing a test of difference. So we are looking for a difference between the revision styles of the math students and the psychology students. Now we've got nominal data here because the revision styles are going to be categorised, isn't it? So maybe like organised revision or cramming revision. And then we've got an independent groups design, which is an unrelated design um, as we refer separately to the math students and the psychology students. OK, a few things just to finish up. Um, use the bullet points refers to those longer answer kind of 12 mark design your own investigation types questions. If you're given bullet points to use, use those bullet points to structure your answer. Take time with statistics. It's very, very easy to accidentally think, oh, that's nominal data instead of ordinal data and potentially get the test wrong. Um, watch out for the maths. The maths is worth 10% over the whole of your A-level. So take your time if asked to do a calculation. 
And finally, make research methods your friend. It's worth the most out of everything on your entire A-level. So really, really give it the time that it deserves in your revision. Thank you and good luck.